contributors uh, to the book and engaging in what I hope um, will be a, a lively and interesting discussion. Um, as I've mentioned, this is uh, the launch event for the book Land, Law and Chiefs in Rural South Africa, Contested Histories and Current Struggles. Um, and the book is co-edited by William Baynard, Rosalie Kingwell and Gavin Capps. Um, and this, co uh, this event is co-hosted by the Society Work and Politics Institute at WITS um, and the Land and Accountability Research Center at UCT. So before we get into proceedings, I'm going to start with a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the first and perhaps most important at a book launch event is to let you know how and where to find and purchase a copy of the book, which we encourage you all to do. Uh, the book is available in both print copies um, and e versions of the book, uh, and those can be purchased um, at online retailers as well as bookstores. And please keep an eye on the comments section for more information uh, on where you can purchase the book, which we would encourage you all to do. Uh, second housekeeping point is just to give you a sense that we'll be running for a maximum of 90 minutes. Uh, we're going to try and keep things quite tight in order to not take up uh, too much of our time uh, in, in today's event, but we'll be running uh, to a maximum of about 90 minutes. And the sort of order of proceedings will be that I will uh, hand over for some introductory remarks to one of the co-editors, Professor Baynard. And then from there, we'll hear from the contributors. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some time for a bit of discussion uh, and to take some questions and comments um, from all of you who are joining us. The third point then is to please encourage you all to put your comments, your questions, your thoughts, uh, responses uh, to what you're hearing this evening into the comments section. We are monitoring that uh, and it will be channeled to the panelists, but also open um, to others to contribute. I would like to uh, issue a special invitation to the other contributors to the book who aren't joining us as panelists, but who may well be joining this live event. Please also use the comments space um, to pitch in, to send your thoughts uh, and to send some comments from your side. So uh, to Gavin, Sonobile, Derek, Aisha, Joanna, Tiane, Ralph, uh, Raphael, Tara, Rosalie, and Janine, uh, please do use that space um, to also insert your voices into the conversation. Right, that said, that's the end of the housekeeping. Uh, I now have the pleasure of handing over to Professor William Baynard, who is one of the co-editors of the book. Uh, Professor Baynard is an emeritus professor at St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford, uh, and he is a senior research associate with the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Professor Baynard has researched and published widely on land reform as well as restitution and chieftaincy cases in both the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, um, and he joins us uh, from the United Kingdom. Over to you, William, for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Nolindi. On behalf of the editors, this collection results from three workshops that focused on contestations over land, law, and political authority in South Africa's rural areas. The editors would like to thank Peter Delius, who with Gavin Capps and Swap initiated the first workshop, and Inka Klaassens, who with Rosalie Kingwell and Locke convened the second, and Michelle Hay, who assisted with the third. We should also thank Wits University Press for their patience. The first workshop was prompted by the rec recognition that academics were increasingly being drawn into legal cases around these issues as expert witnesses and researchers for government, communities, and lawyers. The workshops also incorporated lawyers, NGOs, and activists, and the chapters are a small selection of the papers presented. We tried to include contributions both by established academics and younger researchers. Our focus is largely on the former Bantustans of apartheid South Africa, where perhaps 30% of the population resides still, but also land transferred in land reform. These are the site of some South Africa's poorest communities and also increasingly the site of mining and urban development. Much of the land has been held in forms of customary tenure and key issues are who owns and controls the land and mineral resources in these areas, who can make decisions about its exploitation and who should benefit. Each author brings their own perspectives. We haven't tried to impose complete uniformity to historical and current issues, but I think all share a common concern about the rights of rural people, their participation in local political processes, and their access as landholders to benefits from developments of their land, democratic processes, and popular rights. <clears throat> 
These chapters show how the courts have been drawn into contested cases and the role also of the constitutional court in protecting such rights. But the chapters show a worrying trend in which corporate interests and local elites, particularly chiefs, insert themselves as major beneficiaries or suppress local opposition to their authority. And it's these tensions that many of the chapters focus on, the control of land, resources and development, and how and whether popular rights and interests are being or can be advanced. And in these disputes, especially where they reach the courts, interpretations of history and custom are invoked. We think these processes are of great importance to the country as a whole, with relevance to inequality and insecurity. And as land reform expands and the ANC incorporates traditional authority in government, we think the issues are becoming more central in a wider range of areas. Thanks. Thank you so much, William, uh, for giving us that context and understanding as to the book's genesis, uh, but also framing for us some of the issues that the book se seeks to explore and expand upon. Uh, we move now to hearing from some of the contributors to this collection of essays. Um, I'm going to uh, just give an indication of who we're going to hear from and the order in which they're going to speak, and then I will introduce uh, each of the speakers um, before, they, uh, before they share with us some thoughts. So we'll be hearing from advocate Jeff Budlinder. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Kumisho Mohalani, who will then be followed by Denewos Kosana, uh, and who will be followed uh, at the end by advocate Tembegang by Tobi. Um, so advocate Jeff Badlinder, who will begin for us. Uh, advocate Badlinder is uh, an advocate who practices mainly uh, in Cape Town um, on issues related to constitutional law, uh, public law and administrative law generally, as well as land law. Uh, he was previously the national director of the Legal Resources Center and subsequently the director general of the Department of Land Affairs um, from May 1996 to January of 2000. He has served as an acting judge of the High Court in Cape Town uh, and in Johannesburg, and he has appeared as counsel in the higher courts in South Africa, including the Constitutional Court, um, in many of the cases that he speaks about uh, in his chapter and contribution to the book. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Nirlindi, uh, and good evening. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly is the implications of the fact that South African law after 1994 reflects a duality and what, how that duality plays itself out or has played itself out in constitutional law or in, in customary law. The, the duality is a, is a tension between continuity on the one hand and rupture on the other. On the one hand, talking of rupture, we have what is described as a, as a transformative constitutional constitution, which is aimed at achieving fundamental change in the lives of South Africans. But there are a number of factors which oppose or work against rupture and for continuity. Uh, I'll mention three. Firstly, the people, the personnel of the legal system, the judges and practitioners. When 1994 arrived, most of them were white, most of them were male. That remains the case today, although to, to a lesser extent, the judges were almost all white and male. And the practitioners who are now the judges, by and large, never studied constitutional law. They studied law at a time when we didn't have a proper constitution, we didn't have a, a, a constitution of a, of a involving constitutional democracy, entrenched constitution. And we, for many of them, didn't study customary law either. And so we inherited a personnel who came from a different place who came from the past and who were rooted in the past. Secondly, a second factor against, against change and for stasis was the modes and the processes and the discourse and the culture of legal practice. It's an extraordinary thing that in 2021, you stand up in a court and address the judge as my lord or my lady. That's an old feudal uh, custom. It's, it's been left, it's been abolished in the, in the Constitutional Court and now in the, in the Supreme Court of Appeal, but still in the High Courts we have lords and ladies. It's, it reflects the mode and the culture of the profession which continues to prevail. And then the third factor which works against rupture and for continuity is the rule of precedent. Uh, 
Lawyers work in, in common law systems and in our system work on the basis of precedent. When you ask a lawyer, what's the law today? The lawyer's first thought often is, well, what was the law yesterday? Because the law yesterday governs what is the law today. The law's, lawyer's first instant, first thought is not to say, what should the law be tomorrow? What should the law be today for the purposes tomorrow of tomorrow? We think in terms of precedent, we operate in a system of precedent. And of course, at a time of change, that's a fundamentally uh, conservative premise. And so the purpose of my chapter in the book is to look at how this tension between rupture, between rupture and uh, continuity has played out in the field of customary law. And I conclude that this has been a surprisingly radical project of the Constitutional Court in particular. Whether it was a conscious project, no one can really say, or no one outside it can say, but in some ways it's the most radical of the projects that the court has undertaken. Uh, there is and there remains a duality. On the one hand, there is the new stress in our new regime, legal regime of customary law as one of the three pillars of a new South African law. It's no longer something outside the mainstream, it's now part of the mainstream, uh, together with statutes, together with the common law. And the status and the centrality of, of uh, customary law have changed fundamentally. But at the same time, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a fundamental change. At the same time, we look through the customary law through very different lenses. We look through it through lenses of a constitution, which is fundamentally different. And the constitution keeps on telling us whenever it talks about something relating to the traditional or the customary, it always says the traditional or the customary subject to the provisions of the constitution. Traditional leadership subject to the provisions of the Bill of Rights. And so the, are you hearing, hearing me now a bit better? That's better, thank you. Okay, so so we we the the we look at we look at the law through the lens of the constitution, which is a uh, fundamentally different way of looking at the law. And this, but the second and the more fundamental step, in a way, has been the more radical step, which is that the courts now look at the old established norms of customary law with some suspicion almost. They say, well. What you see in the textbooks and in the old judgments may not be right. It may not be right because what was written there, what is written there may reflect the views of white observers of what was going on in those societies. So it's at best, it's an outsider's view by and large. Secondly, it may not be right because it's been vitrified or ossified. It hasn't recognized that these things change over law over time. And it pretends that the law changes at a very slow pace, which is not the, not the same not so in relation to customary law, which is much more adaptive. And thirdly, they, rep they may represent a deliberately distorted form of customary law, distorted in order to serve the interests of colonial rulers and apartheid rulers. And so they look at the, at the customary law with some reserve and with some suspicion almost, and they say, well, how do we know this is really what it is, what it says? And it's the only area of the law that really that I'm aware of where, where, you can, where you can say to a judge without flinching, well, it may be that that's what the appeal court said in 1942, but who knows whether that was right in the first instance, and who knows whether that has anything to do with where we are now. Uh, that's not something you can say very easily in the other parts of the law. You can, but not to the same extent. And so the, the move away from precedent in, in respect of customary law. Precedent, as reflected in the textbooks and in the old judgments, is a potentially radicalizing move. It removes a straitjacket which binds us in, in the law generally. So the paper looks at the themes of change which emerge from some of the judgments of the Constitutional Court in a number of fields. They've been judgments which really changed the picture in respect of customary land rights, which William mentioned, in respect of women's rights to property, in respect of the appointment of women as chiefs, in respect of marriage and divorce, and in respect of the right of dissent in traditional communities. All of those are matters which have come before the Constitutional Court. And I think most people would take the view that the judgments have been largely progressive and they have charted a rather different way forward. <clears throat> 
But there are two major issues which remain largely unaddressed and which, are, which go to the heart of what we're discussing this evening. And those are questions of traditional authority. Traditional authority in two respects. Firstly, uh, accountability of traditional leaders to those uh, in their communities. And secondly, the issues of democratic process. The accountability of the, of the power of traditional leaders has been, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, a failure under the new regime. Old methods have not worked. Old methods devised for diff very different sorts of societies at a very different time don't really work today. And the new methods which have been evolved in the statutes, the acts and the regulations which govern traditional authorities have been by and large a miserable failure. And so there are fundamental questions of accountability, which is an element of democracy. What are the accountability systems in the 21st century? What are they and what should they be and how do we achieve them? And one can hope to see working through the judgments as we go forward, the courts starting to come to terms with how you adapt old systems of accountability to a very different society and how do you construct systems of accountability which are consistent with the constitutional order. Because in our constitutional order, all power is to be accountable. Most traditional power in a customary or traditional sense today has very limited accountability. Second, this goes, of course, very much to the question that William raised of who benefits and who controls the resources of the community. Related to that is the question of the appointment or recognition of traditional leaders. What is the role of the popular voice? What is the role of popular acceptability in the determination of who will be the traditional leaders? Is it really, as the textbooks tell us, simply a story of succession according to genealogical lines, or is it more subtle than that? And what is the true system and what is the true system to be in a democratic society? The case which is leading the world will lead the way, I think, in that regard is the Sistar case, which is going uh, shortly to the, to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And so Williams, the, the, the title of the topic of the book, Contested Histories, Contested Histories is very much what the constitutional law project is about, because we have to look back to the histories of customary communities and say, what was really the history there? What, what is the true history? What are the real practices? And how are they evolved? How have they evolved over time? Secondly, it's not only contested history, it's current struggles. And as I say, the current struggles, I think, are over these two twin questions, related questions of accountability of power and democracy and power. That's involved, really come before the Constitutional Court only once in the Pilane case, uh, on a, an issue which is important, but which doesn't go to the heart of where does power lie and how is power held accountable in traditional communities. That will be, I think, the greatest challenge which the Constitutional Court faces in trying to, to create a new and different cost, uh, customary law which is based on its historical roots. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, uh, for that wonderful framing on these themes of rupture and continuity. Our next speaker, and uh, who also contributed to the book, is uh, Humisho Mokhoane. Uh, Humisho is a senior lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Johannesburg. She's a historian of the European Empire in Southern Africa, with a current focus on colonial Bechuana land. Uh, she also has an interest in the post-colonial archive, uh, and in this setting, and what it has to offer in this setting uh, for an interdisciplinary inquiry into nationhood, moral lives, and subjectivity. And she explores these practices uh, through studying everyday practice, especially on land and language uh, that mediates uh, actions around land. Humisho, over to you. You're muted, Humisho. <laughs> can you hear me now? We can indeed. Well, thank you very much and good evening. We know that South Africa remains hosted by its past being crippled and overwhelmed by its histories of dispossession, including on the land. My contribution in the edited volume relays how the rage, desperation, and agency of such ordinary men and women who face persistent threats of dispossession on the land can become available in ways expedient for political elites competing for power. In this instance of the early 20th century, 
powerful chiefs were fighting for the control of lands and people in colonial Bichwana land, specifically around the reserve of, pres of present day Mahigang. The colonial government was unable to break the stalemate. It was looking for a mechanism to crush the power of chiefs and ultimately take control of land and people. At least two decades, the government remained a frustrated onlooker as the war raged on. According to the Natives Land Act 1913, the land and people native areas belonged to the government. But in the rivers of Fauna land, this not played into actual capacity to rule people and cause settlement and land holding. The government could neither subdue the war amongst the chiefs nor maintain law and order in the lands it owned. This situation firstly relays how powerless governments can be, regardless of supporting legislation and coercive apparatus to control and resolve contestations on the land in a context of severe and persisting land shortages. The letter of the law under these circumstances can mean very little. Secondly, the situation also points to the limits of litigation as a strategy governed and people rely on to resolve state's land. Colonial courts were repeatedly being presented with the same litigants, the same contestation over the same land, and paid even the same evidence, but a changing narratives of what the evidence meant and its present. Officials grappled where it was more prudent to debate and stick to legal precedents set by earlier court ruling and so maintain the integrity of the jurisprudence they were making, or rather to be directed by present concerns on the ground, especially food shortage and the need to maintain law and order. Furthermore, the very fluid, ambiguous line between private right and communal claims for the same land made designing policy and adjudicating cases very difficult. In fact, the repertoires through people competed for land relied precisely upon such ambiguity. The ambiguity between private and communal claims persists today, sometimes even where people are in possession of title deeds. Historically, the consequence of this ambiguity and the narrative repertoires of contested memories of the past result in repeating cycles of contestations over the same land. These in turn shape arrangements of political power on the land, including chieftaincy. This is how people, re, um, this is how people renegotiate how states and state-like institutions can best enable the establishment of family homes on land, and also the limits of their powers over these homesteads. We know from other settings in Southern and Central Africa that there are no rules, but the no most of political authority is one where ruling is guarantee the security of homesteads on the land. The homestead, as Africanist historians have written, is an institution of honor. A home of one's own facilitates a simultaneous experience of autonomy and dependence, of being in a realm of freedom and sharing at the same time in a community of care. This experience is one of the core attributes of personhood or Botu. In recent years, the term has acquired the warm, fuzzy feelings of community and mutual support. But actually, personhood is a capacity of self that we work, struggle, and compete to make every day. It is that capacity that grants us recognition by us as more just thing, more than the common objects of meta, rock, and trees. Personhood is a peculiar capacity that separates us human beings from nature, but we come by it by conferring it onto one another through moral laws of practice. To have a home of one's own is one such moral practice, without which men and women cannot prove manhood or womanhood and cannot therefore enjoy recognition as persons. As far as the contestations in Bechuana land above, are concerned. It took a long time, but ultimately the colonial government managed to, to atrophy the muscle of chiefs, not because it came up with new policies to that effect or even used force. Rather, 
the government made itself available as an ally for ordinary people to resolve their crisis of personhood. It supported new arrangements of chieftaincy that protected family secure ownership of family homesteads, even though the land belonged to the government and plot sizes were very small. I describe how the collaboration between ordinary people and the colonial government became the stable bedrock towards the Natives Administration Act of 1927. Chiefs lost power as people and colonial officials operated to secure families and homesteads. Therefore, it's not so much a study of a record that war government the loyalty of the people, but how it evolves in the in here and now personhood on the land. And together with ordinary people, tried new solutions to guarantee the autonomy and security of homesteads on the land. The stability and degree of people's confidence in a democratically elected government, I am suggesting, will similarly not depend so much on how we understand the past, but on how we resolve the same dilemmas of landedness, landlessness and personhood today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamisha. Uh, we move then to the next speaker on our panel, um, who is Dineos Kosana. Uh, Dineo is a researcher at SWAP, which is the uh, Society Work and Politics Institute uh, at WITS. She holds a PhD in political science from the University of the Witwatersrand, and her doctoral research explored the contest oceans over coal mining and African grave relocations in Prefontein and Pumalanga. Uh, Dineo has published extensively on the continued salience of traditional leadership in South Africa's democracy, and she has research interests that span indigenous politics and the institution of traditional leadership as well as land, heritage, and belonging. Dineo, over to you. Thank you, Nalini, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, the chapter that I contributed in this uh, book is titled Mining Graves and Dispossession in uh, Mpumalanga. It is extracted uh, from my PhD thesis, which um, uh, investigated mining and the desecration of African ancestral um, graves by Glencoe on white um, owned agricultural farmland in Tuefontein. And Tuefontein lies about 25 kilometers southwest of Whitbank in, in Ochis. The farm and other surrounding uh, ones uh, were once home um, to former labor tenants and migrant laborers, uh, all who have since been relocated for open cast coal mining. Um, in the area. Now, this is what I frame as a mining induced dispossession in the current coal project that swap. So in this chapter, I bring to the fore the voices of the families that I interviewed whose ancestral remains were relocated in an undignified manner using an outsourced cultural management company uh, named Professional Grave Solutions in short, uh, PSG. So since 2011, PSG relocated over a thousand graves, as well as some of the families who lived on the farms. And so these families have since claimed the land uh, since 1998 under the Restitution Act. Now, in the chapter, I pick up at least three areas of contestations. And the first um, contestation that I speak to is over compensation. The problem is that the mining company at Glenco, typical to, I mean, typical um, with, with, you know, uh, with many mining companies or mining corporations, is that they see the graves as uh, standing in a way of uh, profit making. Whereas for the respective families, the graves are considered as sacred and they're seen as a site of connection um, between the living uh, as well as their ancestors. And so just to highlight an example in which there was, you know, the, an example that highlights the contestation of a compensation, uh, Glenco offered 1,500 um, per family um, uh, for the relocation of their graves. 
And the families complained that um, the amount um, could not, um, was inadequate in fact to, to help them perform the rituals that are necessary uh, for the relocations. And one of the problems is that the 1005, which is called a wake fee, is not legislated. And as a result, uh, the decision is left at the discretion of the mining corporations um, on, on exactly how much to give to the families. In my discussion with the families, uh, they said, for instance, that umauzo susa umundu, nomususa amatambo, kosak tengu inkomo, pindu tengu imbuzi, pindu kukayo ujala, besintu. And the translation is that when you relocate people's ancestral graves, you have to uh, buy a, a cow, uh, there has to be a goat. Um, you also have to invite um, distant family members as well as get groceries um, for the event. But the mining companies obviously do not think about um, um, this or consider the, the situation that many families find, them, find themselves in. Uh, another area of, cons of contestation was over um, um, consultation. Uh, the mining company, as well as the heritage management company, used the local radio station um, in Pumalanga. Ikwakwezi uh, FM is much more popular, as well as um, site notifications on cemeteries. But obviously, um, people do not always see these notifications on site because they don't frequently go to the symmetries, even though they, they, you know, they do visit um, once in a while. And so one of the concerns that were raised were, was that the, new, the, 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 the consultations were not uh, a negotiated process. Uh, usually the families were being told and really not asked for their permission. And another area of contestation that I pick up is over over the manner in which the graves were relocated. Um, for example, many recalled um, the use of, of black refuse bags for their, for their ancestral remains, as well as small coffins um, in the process of the relocations. And this was a major concern because, you know, um, choosing a coffin is really a sentimental thing for families. Uh, in particular, when um, an elderly person was buried in, a, in an adult coffin and therefore later uh, being put in um, childlike um, coffins. You know, this was pretty much uh, problematic for the families because it symbolized some level of disrespect. And, and so the chapter uh, submits uh, primarily that uh, the contestations over grave relocations um, were because graves or image rather because graves are evidence of a history that is entangled with narratives of land dispossession and restoration. The graves are a validation of existence uh, of belonging for those who were historically dispossessed. They tell a story and we see, for example, I'll just you know, read um, a quote from one of the women that I interviewed uh, who was mired in a battle over ownership of a grave. And this is what Evelyn had said. I found clothes on my remains. Sibongile, my daughter, was wearing a little, a little dress and a little jersey with flowers. God did well because there were contestations over that grave. Anna had been saying it's their grave, her siblings' grave. So when we got there, we found Sibongile's clothes, which she wore when she drowned. And so the remains were able to tell a story. They showed agency. 
they provided an identity and ultimately uh, resolved a battle between the two families. And so what we see here, which is you know, something that was said by many of these families are that graves are an evidence of the past. And the concern was that when mining companies relocate these graves, they erase an identity, they erase a history past, they also erase uh, people's sense of belonging, as shifting as that may be, or as fluid as that may be. And so broadly speaking in this chapter, I locate the contestations uh, in the context of South Africa's mineral law, which is the NPRPA, as well as the Heritage Act under which the graves are protected. And the argument that I make is that when the two pieces of legislation go against one another, the market-driven NPRPA takes precedence over the protection of graves. And it is within uh, the ambits of the MPRDA that this position uh, continue to take place in the post-apartheid South Africa. Now, what the chapter also illustrates is how narrowly this position has been thought out historically. Um, conceptually, uh, this position has only been linked to the loss of land, uh, but not linked to how this loss uh, deprived Africans their physical uh, means through which they could uh, access the spiritual realm, which in my work I term um, intangible um, connection. So I'd like to uh, perhaps stop here and have um, more further discussions uh, during the Q&A. Thanks, Nalundi. Thank you so much, Danelle. Uh, uh, before I move to the next speaker, just a reminder to those who are uh, joining us to please uh, post your questions uh, and your comments in the comments section, um, because after our final speaker, we'll move to taking some of those questions uh, and open up for a discussion. Uh, our final speaker this evening um, is advocate Tembe Gangwai Tobi, who is an advocate of the High Court. Um, in his early years, he served as a law clerk for Chief Justice Arthur Chaskelson at the Constitutional Court of South Africa, uh, and he also uh, was the director of the Constitutional Litigation Unit at the Legal Resources Center. He's an acting judge at the Land Claims Court of South Africa, uh, and has also authored two books, uh, One Land Matters, South Africa's Failed Land Reforms, which is his uh, recent book, and The Land is Ours, South Africa's First Black Lawyers, and The Birth of Constitutionalism. Over to you, Tebek. Uh, thank you, Nolund, uh, and thank you to the uh, editors, uh, William, uh, Rosalie, and Gavin. Um, it's a fantastic book. For those who want to buy it, this is what it looks like. For many constitutionalists uh, who believe in transformative constitutionalism, and I am one of them, we are often asked where the transformative uh, element in the constitution is. We are often told that section 25 of the constitution sanitizes apartheid land dispossession, that it entrenches the old ownership patterns, that it marginalizes the poor, it strengthens the rights of property owners. It is often said that the reason there is no land reform is because of the inherently constraining structure of section 25 of the constitution. In other words, in its design, the intention was never to disrupt the land patterns of the colonial and apartheid past but it was intended to pretend as if something would change when all along it was known that nothing would change. So we are often asked to prove transformative constitutionalism in practice. Given the catastrophic failures of the land reform program, 
whether one looks at the relationship between the chiefs and quote unquote, the subjects, or whether one looks at the relationship between the state and the governed, or indeed between the property class and the unpropertied class, the evidence of failure is abundant. And so it is increasingly becoming difficult to explain the transformative in transformative constitutionalism because it is not supported by actual evidence, not supported by lived realities of the poor. Nevertheless, constitutionalists should protest the claim that the source of the continued marginalization and the continued dispossession is the constitutional frame itself. So today, the book that you have produced not only explains in coherent, methodical, scholarly ways, the challenges with taking forward the struggle for constitutional change, but it also explores the possibilities for this change, what might it look like. But at the same time as your book was being published, the High Court of Peter Maritzberg was delivering an important judgment involving the Ingonyama Trust, which begins to demystify the notion of transformative in transformative constitutionalism. I am going to spend the rest of the time I have discussing the avenues that are opened by this judgment and how some of the ideas in this book might be taken forward. I read two chapters, uh, Jeff Badlander's chapter and Rosalie Kingwell's chapter, not because of the uh, order of importance, but this was a pure random selection. Jeff explains the ways in which the Constitutional Court has accommodated, defined, and redefined notions of customary law through the prism of the Constitution as a distinct, as opposed to a secondary source of law. Rosalie problematizes notions of private land ownership in communal structures, how are they embedded? She also challenges the oversimplification of the notion of communal. And she criticizes ideas of tenure in section 25.6 that are reductionist, only utilized as protections against eviction. But what is she trying to say? She is trying to ask for a radical forward-looking notion of tenure, which is not only protection against eviction. Both the notions of customary law under the constitution and its disruptive effect on inherited forms of tenure are explored in the case brought by um, Kasak against the Ingonyama Trust decided on the 1st of June, 2021. The brief history is around the protection, sorry, rather the, what is called the PTOs, um, permissions to occupy rights. The brief historical account of these dates back to the late 19th century as a consequence of the policies of Sir George Gray in the Cape, where the colonial government attempted to introduce private tenure beginning with land surveys. 
it ultimately introduced a quitrent system until that quitrent system was itself abandoned in the 1920s. By the mid 20th century, the system of permissions to occupy was generally widespread. They were granted to people who could not obtain title, but nevertheless lived in common ages or communal settings. The formal recognition into law is reflected in regulations passed in 1969. Here is the paradox then. For those people who lived in the Ingonyama Trust land in KwaZulu-Natal, subsequent laws passed in the 70s and in the 80s confirmed their entitlement to occupy the land through the permission to occupy system. It was not ownership, but it conferred real rights. The paradox is the constitution in at least three sections, 25.1, 25.6, and 25.9, created a constitutional framework to entrench existing forms of tenure and imposed obligations on the state not to take away or to reduce or to deprive existing tenure. So although the PTO system was introduced expressly as an adjunct to the colonial and apartheid regime, it emerges in the post-constitutional system as a form of tenure which may not be taken away, but it can be improved on. A year after the democratic election, another legislation was passed called IPILRA, the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act. It was a crucial piece of legislation intended to only apply for one year, but as the judgment shows, it has consistently been extended because it also protected informal rights to occupation of land, which included persons in occupation of these pieces of paper called permissions to occupy. In 2007, the Ingonyama Trust introduced what the judgment refers to as a leasehold. Everybody who had a permission to occupy was compelled to convert those PTOs into leaseholds. By the leaseholds, they had to pay money to the trust on an annual basis. If they failed to comply with the terms of the lease, they could be ejected from the land. And this is the heart of the case. Was the introduction of the leasehold method consistent with customary law? Often, as I have explained, our debates about tenure have been around the pr protection or prevention of persons from eviction. But what we see in this judgment is using customer law to create greater and more secure rights of tenure. Let me read out some salient parts of the judgment, starting from paragraph 81 to see the full extent of the impact of this judgment. Here's what the judges say. The crucial point about an allocation of residential and arable land from the perspective of the present inquiry is that in terms of indigenous law, no rental was paid for the right of occupation. That is to say, no rental was payable to the beneficiary of the allocation prior to the advent of the Trust Act to the KwaZulu government or its predecessors in title and B, after the advent of the Trust Act to the Ingonyama, the Trust or the Board. In that context, the concept of a lease or leasehold was unknown 
to Zulu customary law. The distinction between customary or indigenous title to land and leasehold rights was not in dispute between the parties in the present matter. The judges continue, and this is what they say at paragraph 92. They draw a distinction between common law ownership and customary law ownership. In common law ownership, the critical element is the right to exclude others from ownership. But in customary forms of ownership, the critical distinguishing factor is the inclusion and the flexibility. But the trust itself was never the common law owner. Instead, as explained in paragraph 95, it was a nominal owner. And this is what the judgment says. As the nominal owner of trust held land, the Ingonyama trust, the Ingonyama, in other words, the king, does not have exclusive rights to own, control, and regulate trust held land, nor does it have an unfettered right to deal with such land. It is common cause that the trust and the board in the execution of their functions and exercise of their powers in terms of the trust act must act within the parameters of such act. Indigenous law, any other applicable law and the constitution. The trust and the board may therefore exercise no power and perform no function beyond that conferred upon them by law. Note here in this judgment that the conduct of the board is now to be judged against the indigenous legal system as an autonomous source of law. In other words, conduct in conflict with customary law would itself be invalid. The source of all of this is a magnificent affidavit drawn by Professor Ntlapo. It is quoted at paragraph 99, where he specifically says, regular rental for land to traditional authorities is an unknown phenomenon under Zulu customary law. So eventually the judges strike down the leasehold program. They reinforce customary law. They reinforce ownership in customary law as indivisible and inalienable in terms of which they mean there can be no secession, there can be no leasehold, there can be no private say. The land belongs to all who live in it. So, and I want to stop now. What we learn is that there are possibilities of the transformative element in transformative constitutionalism, but they have to be found, they have to be theorized, and they have to be supported by academics and practitioners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tembek. Uh, we come then to the question and answer segment uh, of this evening's uh, proceedings. So I'm going to ask the panelists uh, to please turn on their cameras, if at all possible. Um, and then I'm going to take some of the questions that have come in uh, through the question and answer platform, as well as in the comments. Um, to the panelists, if you'd like to see some of the questions and answers that I'm going to be reading, please open both the chat uh, as well as the Q&A. You'll see at the bottom of your screens, you have a Q&A icon. You also have a chat icon. In order to see what I'm seeing, uh, I'd ask you to open both of those. Right, to jump straight in, uh, there is a question from Jill Murray that's directed to you, Danil. Uh, she's asking, um, Danil Skosana, regarding mining companies and grave dispossession, could you comment on what, if any, the role of the DMR was? Uh, there is then also um, a question from Rudy Hilleman. 
It says, why does the legislation focus only on the leadership, uh, Ngosis and Indunas, and not on the polity, Isiswe, to the extent that the leadership uh, are now monthly recipients of salaries? In addition, he says, the accountability by leadership to Isiswe must have been negatively affected. Uh, so perhaps more of a comment than a question. I'm going to go then to the Q&A. Um, there is a question uh, from Merle Lipton in King's College, London. In the political struggle between the chiefs who want to retain or even strengthen their powers and reformers who want to reduce them, the Ingonyama Trust has been a keen player with ANC politicians seemingly nervous of confronting them. During the current unrest in KwaZulu-Natal, the new chief designate, as well as Butelezi, are strongly supporting Ramaphosa. This is to be welcomed, but I worry that this might strengthen the chief's bargaining power with the ANC and delay some necessary reforms, uh, for example, in land rights. Do the excellent participants share this worry? Uh, Tembega, perhaps you can consider that question, um, uh, and perhaps uh, Kumisho, I could ask you to consider that one too. No? Shaking your head? <laughs> if you have any thoughts. Um, then there is a comment from Paul Hebnick. Should we not move away, uh, move beyond, sorry, debates on law and justice to also debate the right, uh, the right, the use of land and its resources according to locally accepted discourses? Contesting land laws is also about contesting fixed notions of land and resource use. Local people have the right to uh, identify their own modernity. There is also then a uh, a question here for Tembega specifically, what are those elements which suggest a transformative approach that could be used to deal with non-belongingness of African people? It is evident that the constitution itself doesn't denounce these crimes of dispossession. Uh, another one here to Tim Becker from Ben Cousins. Uh, what are the implications of your argument for legislation on communal land rights, which is said to be forthcoming? Uh, I'm then going to take one for Jeff from Alan Mubbin. Uh, if I may, what did you mean by wanting to establish true history? Surely history is always contested. Uh, Derek, I note your request about pasting the questions into the chat for the audience to be able to read. Thanks. Um, Let's take those for now. So Daniela, can I start with you and the question that was directed at you? Uh, then can we hear from Jeff and then could we hear from Otem Beger? Um, and I will swing around to our other participants uh, with further questions. Go ahead, Daniela, please. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, primarily the role of uh, DMR is to actually um, oversee the submission of uh, documentation such as, you know, the heritage impact assessment, as well as the environmental impact assessment, uh, but there is no coordination between um, departments. And as a result, uh, usually the violation of, of graves happen without the DMR being away. And this is partly because uh, the applications for the relocations of graves go through um, SARA, uh, which was, uh, it's, it's a body that was established uh, through the National um, Heritage Act. And so, for instance, there's quite a lot of violations that have taken place in KwaZulu-Natal in Somkele where people have lost their graves and these have gone unmarked. And, and, and so DMR is actually not even aware of, of what has happened. And so essentially what I'd say is that uh, DMR serves the purpose of speeding up the issuing of uh, mining licenses. Um, and and I, I, as it stands, I wouldn't say that they have the interest of communities at heart because there's been complaints where communities are saying they're not being thoroughly um, consulted in that the consultation whenever they take place are not uh, meaningful in a way. Um, and so uh, as it stands, I, I'd say, you know, DMR actually is not really it's it's aware but they're not really involved um in 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 in, in this in, in this process thanks Danielle. jeff thanks can you hear me can you hear me now yes we can good uh firstly in response to paul hebnick's comment about debating moving beyond debating law and justice to also debating the rights of the land and its resources according to locally accepted discourses. Well, that's 
precisely what the living customary law approach, which has been embraced by the Constitutional Court, is intended to do. It's intended to say, well, what is the law is, the, the customary law is the law, the custom according to which people live and in court, according to which they regulate their rights and their relationships with each other. And so the essence of the, of the living law approach, which is fundamentally different from, the, different from the notion of the law as written down in the books once and forever, is that the law changes or changes and ought to be reflected and accepted as such as what people actually do on the ground, how people live, how they organize themselves, subject to the constitution. Because if, the, if they organize themselves in a way in which, for example, women are discriminated against, that can't become part of the law because that's inconsistent with the constitution. But subject to that caveat, th that is precisely what the living law approach is intended to, to adopt. In relation to Alan Maven's question, yes, I know history is always contested, but I do, personally, I do, don't believe it's entirely contingent. I do believe that there are some things that are demonstrably true and some things that are demonstrably false. I know there's a whole lot of contingency in between, of the, in between those. The, the litigation which has been run, uh, has uh, the successful litigation which has been run, has leaned very heavily on the work of historians seeking to demonstrate myths in our past and seeking to demonstrate truths in our past. Uh, that doesn't mean the truths are absolute truths and not subject to contestation. The title of the book demonstrates that, contested histories. But I, I, I don't think, Alan, you're suggesting that there is, we can just have to throw up our hands and say, well, there isn't, there's no truth of any kind which can be established. Certainly we know that apartheid was built on lies about our history. And we have to build a new society based on recognizing those lies and on trying to find the truth about our history. Thank you, Jeff. Go ahead, Tembek. Thank you. So the, on the first point about the Ingonyama's relationship with the current government and whether that has any implications for, for the tenure reform of the future, I think it, on the evidence we have so far, when the judgment was announced in the uh, Kasak versus Ingonyama Trust case, the minister uh, sided with the community and not with the trust and explicitly committed to complying with the judgment. So that's the evidence we have so far that the political relationship is not operating to the detriment of communities. But I agree that is something we need to keep our antenna uh, alive on. The second element is what are these elements of the constitution that may dismantle um, the non-belongingness of Africans. Now, I agree with this. I think that there are many aspects of the constitution that depend on construction and interpretation in order to discover the Africanness or the belonging of Africans within the South African society. One of them, of course, is this section nine of the constitution, which is the equality clause. Another is the true purpose of section 25, which is not entrenched by transforming property relations. And so we can go through the various aspects to the constitution. The key is dealing with section 25 in a way that is weighted in favor of the marginalized. And I use this example of the Ingonyama Trust case as demonstrative of what can be achieved with the creative use of the constitution. The last question from Professor Ben Cousins, the implications on the communal land rights. This is a huge question. The only thing I want to say about this, and I don't pretend to have the full answer to it, but it is a point of debate. I think what the Ingonyama Trust judgment has done, at least one of the things it has done, 
is the reorientation of the paradigm of land ownership. That is a crucial breakthrough. Remember that in historical terms, the colonists first denied African ownership. They said it didn't exist. Later on, when they passed the um, Native Administration Act, they said ownership actually belongs to the chiefs. And then later on, which is now, the custom that is being propounded by the chief is the custom completely aligned with the Native Administration Act. So we've moved from a paradigm of no ownership to chiefly ownership. And what we should be moving towards is a paradigm of communal ownership. So this judgment is the first judgment that I have seen, which explicitly recognizes ownership as a concept that it also exists in customary systems, but it is indivisible, it is inalienable. And it explains what that means. In other words, what is precluded from the inalienable and the indivisible elements of ownership. So that will be crucial because the first version of the Communal Land Rights Act was premised on the colonial notions of denying ownership and conferring ownership on chiefs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, you want to add something? Go ahead. Yes, I just want to add one thing to what to, to the question, response to Mel Lipton's question. I, th I think one of the strange paradoxes of the last 10 to 15 years is that as the Constitutional Court has been finding its feet and embarking on this attempted revision or transformation of our understanding of these relationships and these power relationships, Parliament has been moving quite energetically in the opposite direction. We've, it has been entrenching old systems and rules and, uh, and entrenching old powers. And one only has to look for, look for that to the traditional leadership laws and to the communal land legislation which has been proposed. And so there is a strange, a strange disjuncture, quite ironic, given that the courts are supposedly conservative and elitist and Parliament speaks for the people in a radical sense, that in fact it's been the courts which have been more progressive and Parliament which has been uh, entrenching existing relationships when it has gone to legislation. That I think is partly reflected, is partly reflective of uh, a whole series of political relationships that exist and other relationships which are a long story which I won't go into now. It is a very odd paradox. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner and William to uh, perhaps go first in this next round. Uh, there's a question here, it's a comment actually from Desmond Brown, but perhaps it surfaces a question around uh, missing voices uh, in, you know, in sort of historical narratives. And so the comment here is, in almost all the books which have been published and the discourse on land reform, very little is said about the first dispossessions of land, that of the Khoikhoi and San people. There is no acknowledgement of the loss and need for redress or some form of restitution. Is this not indicative of, of a fundamental skewing or misstatement of the issue of land reform? Is it not also a deliberate omission to sanitize history and protect the spoliators and their ill-begotten rights in land? Uh, as I say, more of a comment than a question, but perhaps uh, if, if either of you want to share some thoughts on some of uh, the, the narratives and voices that get left out uh, in the ways in which history is retold. I'm then going to uh, scroll down the list to uh, a question from Ngosi Sipinyandu, uh, who asks, in a situation where communities refused to move away, paving the way for a mining company, is the government allowed to dispossess people of their land? Um, Daniel, perhaps you want to come in here or uh, any of the other colleagues. There is then a, a comment from Barbara van Koppen uh, that many of these excellent points also apply to customary water tenure, where water resources are pertinent to customary law, I hope that's how you say that word, to be shared by all with people's vibrant bottom-up initiatives in further developing water in line with section 27 uh, on water and food and chiefs seem to support and mediate in conflicts. We debate provisions to the National Water Act for such recognition and if you're interested she then leaves her contact details. Uh, I'm going to take um, uh, the question from Simon Becker, 
uh, it reads, today, the metro Eteguini includes areas that used to be in KwaZulu. In these areas, traditional chiefs share service responsibilities with elected ward councillors. Any constitutional analysis? Uh, so it seems here Simon is raising this question about uh, a fourth tier of government and the kind of intersection between uh, local government and uh, traditional leadership. So Jeff uh, or Tim Becker, perhaps one of you could speak to that from a constitutional perspective. There is then a question for Utem from uh, Masala, the reinforcement of the inclusive nature of customary law ownership. How do we then deal with uh, when decisions have to be made on property, e.g. Dispos disposal or granting rights, uh, others the right to use? How are decisions made in a setting where there is a compound structure, for example, a family or a household? Um, there is then a question directly for uh, Deneo, which is uh, from Sta Yeni. Uh, a question for Dr. Skosana on the notions of belonging. How did the people you interviewed speak about belonging and were the graves the only reference point? Uh, and then the final question, ownership as a right allows people to get finance. How will this communal ownership assist communities to get funding? Uh, I'll leave that question open to anybody who'd like to answer it. Uh, so could we hear from Kumisho, uh, William, if you have any thoughts, uh, and then come to Dineo um, and round out with uh, Jeff and Tim Becker. Um, I could perhaps respond to the question about the sand, the special land. Um, if I remember correctly, the question was asking um, why that history is not part of the present debate on land reform and uh, whether or not there is a kind of deliberate attempt to, um, to forget. I think it's an important question because I think it raises the question of how long um, the history of um, of land contestations in Southern Africa have been, that we're not dealing with a recent history. Um, and in fact, one can argue, depending on the kinds of historians you read or, or the kind of historiographical approach you want to explore, one can actually, one can actually argue that um, South African politics has been for a long time, um, perhaps even longer than um, the history of European settlement being determined and shaped by the fact that you had large populations and um, fast growth and not in um, uh, a pastoral and other kinds of lands available for settlement. Um, so I'm not sure that I would say that um, it's a question of, um, of deliberately forgetting. I would say that it invites us to think more critically about, in fact, um, whether or not dealing with the historical question all the time is sufficient? Should we not be asking other questions around what are the limits of our understanding of what has happened in the past? Does it help us perhaps to think around what are the pressures of the land today, including food, uh, um, food shortage, including the need for people to be able to have a sense of ownership over their lives and over property? Um, is it possible perhaps to focus a lot more, not to say that those, those, um, those questions do not matter, but to, to, to understand that such a long history, they are so entirely overwhelming sometimes of the limitations that we have in thinking through land, that it could be perhaps better to have a much more inclusive conversation on the now and to find conversations on the now and solutions on the now that can be able to help everybody um, and be fair and just to everybody, not just Black Africans, but also, of course, I can entirely agree, also, of course, populations like the same who have not necessarily been included in current conversations on land and land reform today. So for me, the, the real answer is, 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 um, is a question. What are the limits of historical analysis on the resolution of today's land problems? and contestations on the land. That would be how I would look at that question. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, William, any thoughts from your side? You're muted, William. Could I address briefly three points that have come up? The first, I think, was Rudy Hilleman, and that the legislation deals with chiefs and seems to privilege them and not with the polity or the assizware. Um, firstly, uh, 
the 2003 Framework Act does in fact have quite extensive sections on traditional councils, including, for example, the representation of women on traditional councils. I don't think that's in a way, I mean, that seems to me an important element of legislation that hasn't fully been uh, in, uh, implemented. But I would say an even more critical thing for me is not so much whether the legislation favors chiefs or a notion of a traditional polity. It is, is South Africa going to have wall-to-wall -wall traditional authorities? In other words, it's the conceptions of rights in the rural areas, in my view, need to go beyond traditional authorities. And the possibility of these extending further, for example, there's a chapter on CPAs by Tara Weinberg. Now, it, CPAs provide a different form of rural authority, a collective form of ownership, and yet there are plenty of examples of traditional authorities trying to take them over. It seems to me that the issue is what are the limits of these two acts of 2003 and 19. The second point is enforcement, and I agree, somebody brought this up, it's very important, and there are two or three chapters, particularly the ones which deal with former Transkai by Chaskulkson and myself, where the state hasn't been able to enforce what I would say were progressive restitution judgments um, in Holweni and Mgungunlovu, where it's been very difficult to enforce them. And the same arises in Kolobeni, which was not uh, a restitution case, but immediately the, the, the popular rights, or if you want, community rights to land had been uh, uh, accepted by the judge the minister, Gwede Matasha, in this case, immediately tried to overturn the judgment and enforce the state's support for mining activity there. It's not resolved yet, but it's difficult to know which branch of the state is really going to support the community. But my third point is probably the most controversial because I disagree, I think, with what a couple of the other panelists are saying. To me, the crux is really in the notion of customary is the family land holding. And here I will say that I'm informed by Kamisha's presentation that she may not wish me to make this argument on the basis of it, but that, that this should be the crux rather than the community. Because in a few of our cases, I would say significant number of our cases, it is, I think this came up in a question, the capacity of the community acting together to dispossess people within it that has caused the legal conflict. Thank you, William. Uh, Dineo. Dineo. Yes, Narindi. Um, thank you for that question, Ta. I mean, what was interesting was that most of the families, when they spoke about uh, belonging, they linked it to um, the notion of home. And, and, and in the notion of home, there was this idea that um, the grave served as that qualification that, that this is home and this is the space they've once occupied and this is the space that has has their their history um, written all over it, and in I think several times um, most of them also spoke about uh, belonging in relation to um, where their umbilical cord uh, falls, and that that space is marked um, with the umbilical cord, signifying that. Um, this is where they are born, but also this is where they will die. And so many of them actually had experienced um, um, dispossession um, throughout, for instance, the 50s, because some of them were labor tenants and even earlier. Um, and so what you see is that there's sort of shifting notions of belonging, but also shifting notions 
um, of home. But what I find is that um, the graves in a way sort of anchored them in that even though they'd shift to different spaces, they could still go back to that particular site that they defined um, um, as home. And I think in my own thinking about this is that when you think about dispossession, um, how it has taken place historically, it stripped off people's um, citizenships or rather the right to citizenship. And so it's difficult to speak about how people post 1994 become citizens when, for instance, the land question has not been addressed in, in, in South Africa. And so that's why people then have a problem when, uh, or the families actually spoke about um, uh, the problem of grave relocations because this uh, invalidates their existence and in a way um, disqualifies them from being actual citizens of the country, even though, uh, of course, there has been reconcilia uh, reconciliation post 1994. So, um, it's a very interesting question, which I don't have a full uh, full answer for. Uh, but my understanding is that it's 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 very much linked to the notion of home, as as fluid as as that looks like, particularly because the, we're talking about families um, with a history of labor tenancy. Thanks, Danelle. Uh, Timberg, I'll come to you, and then I'll give Jeff the last word. Thank you. So I just want to say three things and I'll hopefully be very short. The first one is to resist the notion of festism. There is a temptation in the present discourses, largely, by the way, fueled by those who just do not want to let go of the land, that the people who first settled on the land were today described as colored people, they were koi koi people, etc. So that's what I call festism. Now, one of the reasons we have to resist festism is because actual identities have shifted over time. In the Eastern Cape, it is virtually impossible to draw distinctions between koi koi people and Kosa people. Because over time, even before the arrival of Van Riebeek, over time, those identities were very, very fluid identities. Take, for instance, one of the most heroic uh, quote unquote tribes, Amagunukwebe. It is impossible. The Amagunukwebe tribe dates back to the 1400s, the 1500s. They have produced many Kosa warriors, Mele, Makoma. And so, festism necessarily essentializes a person into Koi Koi or Kosa when the social reality is that those identities were actually broken long ago. But fascism is also a problem because in 1910, it was necessary to create racial identities in order to know who has rights to what. And that period saw massive de-Africanization of people that were labeled colored, but were traditionally, or they regarded themselves as African. But fascism is also imported into the apartheid structures. So fascism is a, an enemy of progress. It always presents itself as resolving an unresolved historical problem. But in reality, what it does is to serve an, as an obstacle to the recognition of the ambiguity uh, of identity. And it is one of the reasons we have to speak openly, firmly against notions of fascism. Secondly, on the issue of customary, I mean, one of the, the, well, the, one of the two chapters I read is Rosalie Kingwell's um, chapter. It's it actually it's interesting. It deals with the notion of customary and the inclusive nature of customary, and particularly who has rights to say what in a compound structure. So I would recommend that you have regard to that. Then the third point, I just want to come back to Williams' Uh, argument about co community versus family. 
I think that if you look at community versus the state, in other words, is the land owned by the state or is it owned by the community? I think there, there is no contest. And at the same time, if you look at community versus chiefs, is the land owned by the chief or owned by the community? Even there, there is no contest. The contest you, you are introducing is a contest between community and family, who owns the land between the community and family. But I think even that question is uh, itself needs problematization because it is possible to accommodate rights of family in land that is owned by the community. The idea of communal ownership is still a crucial idea in order to protect incursions by the state and the chiefs and often by commercial interests. But inside the realm of community ownership are multiple rights and interests which are exercisable at the instance of the family. In fact, the Ngonyama judgment is so crucial on that from paragraph 136, I think it goes on to 145, defining what rights the family has. And here, the central point is who must consent in the event of possible dispossession. And the judgment makes it clear that it's the individual. It's actually even more, much more narrow than family. It's the individual that must consent. Thank you. Thanks, Tembeck. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. You're muted. Right. I don't know whether Tim Baker saw the question from Sel or Ramasala, which is about if the family is at the root, how are decisions made inside the family and household? I'm glad to say that he addressed that question to Tim Baker and not to me, and so I shan't attempt to answer it, except to say that I think uh, that's a very hard question, Sel, uh, as you very well know. Uh, but the one thing, the one, the one answer I can give is what it's not. The answer can't, the, the, the decision can't be made by some superstructure, by the community structure, or by somebody outside the family. Family rights have to be determined by family members. And of course, how you deal with those, how those decisions are made is a vexed question, not only in African families. Uh, that is a, a long, long lasting issue. Finally, on Simon Becker's question, it really comes back to, to uh, the issue I raised, one of the issues I raised, he says Etiquini includes areas that used to be in KwaZulu. In those areas, traditional chiefs share service responsibilities with elected ward councillors. Any constitutional analysis? I think that raises a very important question. It's an issue which emerges from the now new legislation, what's a new legislation dealing with traditional leaders, the tra traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act, uh, which uh, creates some people will say, and I think with some substance, what is actually a fourth level of sphere of government. The constitution contemplates three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local. It recognizes the institution of traditional leadership subject to the constitution. And so one has to find a way of integrating those mechanisms in a way which doesn't create a situation where the, where the traditional leaders become the government. Uh, I, it goes, to, goes back to the questions, I think, of accountability. It goes back to questions of democratic process. And it goes back to the question that William raised, which is wall-to-wall -wall traditional leadership implies customary, it implies compulsory association under in traditional communities. The only form of association which is recognized and which is enforced by law is the so-called traditional seems to me that's very, very much inconsistent with democratic notions and with notions of a society where the customary law is changing, changing all the time and has to be recognized in that way. Thank you, Nrindi. Thank you so much, Jeff. I had said Jeff would have the last word, but Kumisho has convinced me that she'd like to make one last point before I close and that will be the end of it. Go ahead, Kumisho. I will be very brief. I will be very brief. Um, this is just, a, I do welcome William's um, um, incorporation of my, uh, my paper into the argument because I do think we need to recognize that there are support um, private ownership or private claims to land that are not communal as, as customary. There are, in fact, um, court cases 
where people um, take questions uh, to court and function with them based on customary law. So I think we need to know that the idea of mutual court is that um, indeed a uh, protect less in your know, it's very strong and popular, but it doesn't mean uh, uh, in some parts of Southern Africa at least, especially where I'm working, it does not mean that private ownership private entitlements to land are not protected also by customary right. I think the point I'm trying to make is one has to be careful around how people contest those, how they test the ambiguity between private and communal and how they actually use that same ambiguity in order to defend the rights of families and homestead on the land. I think um, the historical point has to be made around um, the place of, of, of private entitlements on the land as important as um, the, the claims being made on communal um, land. Because, uh, just very briefly, was the question around ownership, the financial um, implications of, um, of these lands of ownership that are uh, fully communal based. I think it's important to dis, um, for us to discuss that. Well, of course, now we can't because time doesn't allow that, but I, I do think that questions of finance, questions of rent, of, um, of, of, uh, of letting the land, of buying and selling the land, these questions around making the land profitable as a commodity also have very strong historical resonance in the archive, where Africans themselves are saying, we have to have the right to let the land, that, that um, people collecting rent are not being European or colonial, that there are very strong arguments for selling, for letting, for transferring land in the um, for transferring lands, which are um, important to consider historically as well as today. So very briefly, but that's all I just want to add. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to draw us to a close. We have all been sitting still for 19 minutes, and that feels like quite uh, a steep ask of all of us. Uh, I have a quick list of thank yous. Uh, an event like this obviously doesn't come together uh, without a lot of work behind the scenes. So our first thanks is to the panel uh, for making the time to join us this evening, to Jeff Tenberger, Daniel, uh, Commissioner William. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time to uh, stimulate the conversation. I think we've had a great conversation. Um, to the co-editors, to William, uh, to Gavin, and to Rose. Rosalie, thank you for the work that you put in, not only into bringing this event together, but obviously uh, the invisible work that goes into bringing together a volume such as this one. Um, our thanks as well to the team at Wits University Press. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the team at SWAP, uh, to Prashani, to Tasneen, uh, and to Mbuso. Thank you very much for hosting the platform, for doing the technical side of things. Uh, and to my own colleagues at Lark, uh, Monica and Amalinda, thank you very much uh, for helping to hold this. Uh, and then finally, to all of you for joining us. There is no event without people on the other side of the ether. So thank you very much uh, for sticking with us uh, for the full 90 minute process. My apologies to Gaynor, to Sien, uh, to Tuane, whose questions and comments we weren't able to get to. Uh, and then finally, a reminder again, please purchase the book. Um, it is available both in print copy and uh, in e-copy and can be purchased uh, at online retailers as well as in bookstores. There is also information that was put in the comments about how to source the book based on where you are, uh, whether you're based locally or internationally. Um, I am going to, uh, with that, draw us all to a close and thank you all very much for joining us. Have a very